So we're entering part eight of what I didn't know exactly where it was going to go. Um, I think at this point, the one thing that is left for me to do in terms of making an introduction to Lacan is leaving the seven parts that I have provided as it is. Um, I'm probably going to include a little bit of more extra material that it's not made by me into the playlist that I have set up for it. Um, particularly because it's important for us to engage with different uh, people in psychoanalysis to get a sense of how their different practices elaborate. So, by way of conclusion, I want to talk about what we've done so far, see how far we've gone, and how it, uh, is it that it tells us still about psychoanalysis in Lacan. And lastly, I want to work a little bit of a bibliography and tell a little bit about what I've read by Lacan and how I've come to read them over time. This is not to say that my reading is going to be definitive. If anything, one of the main things that I learned about Lacan and reading Lacan is that there's a certain element of indeterminacy of what I'm trying to look for in Lacan. Uh, to a certain extent, how we've talked about how the analyst plays this role of the big other almost as an empty formal depository for my, my finding and making desire, um, I find that Lacan plays a similar role in that respect that through, through reading Lacan, we're at the same time trying to find and, cons and make desire. But of course, that's gonna vary quite a bit in terms of what that actually looks like. So, to begin with, we started by making a discussion of, psychoana uh, of psychoanalysis from a distance. We only encounter psychoanalysis as something that we could talk around by way of uh, what is most available to us, mostly jokes about it, or some form of dismissal or another. For anyone that has engaged in a course in sociology or psychology, the first thing that they're likely to tell you if they are in the North American world, particularly the Anglosphere, is that Freud will be oftentimes the only person brought up as the fear of psychoanalysis, only to be dismissed or point out some of the more odd aspects about him. So, for instance, that he um, prescribed co cocaine to patients, even though his engagement with cocaine predate um, the development of psychoanalysis and also coincide with some of uh, Freud's personal restraint in terms of engaging with the substance later on. So, in that respect, we were able to take this sort of distance from psychoanalysis in jokes about your mom or Freud or Dix as a way to find our way into the practice itself. That in this regard, psychoanalysis coincided with the subject matter of sex, sexuality, the way that it pertains to the function of truth of psychoanalysis. That we are talking around it, and by talking around it, in fantasizing about analysis, the act itself, whether it's psychoanalysis or sex, we are coming to learn about it. The same way that a kid uh, is trying to figure out what is it that his or her or their parents are doing behind the door in their bedroom, the same way we start picturing psychoanalysis about what is it that's happening behind these doors. So the first educated move I think we were able to start doing about learning about the psychoanalytic act itself, the circumstance of psychoanalysis, was by returning to a pretty basic mythologized image. The duvet where Freud would be sitting behind you, listening to you. By returning to this duvet, this couch, we're starting to pick apart some of the aspects of psychoanalysis that have been ingrained into the myth, but it is only by asking exactly why these elements of the myth, of this structure of the myth is the way it is, we're learning about what is it that the analyst does. First of all, we learn that self-narration is a key element to the analytic experience, and that self-narration is also operating in relationship very closely to the listening of the analyst. But we don't quite stop there either, because we are asking the question, what is the analyst listening for so carefully? And in this regard, we are looking out for how is it that the analysand is struggling between speaking themselves out, but also being spoken out as such, saying a little bit more than they intend to. In, when we're looking at the analytic discourse, we're looking at how is it that it, the unconscious speak. And this is not something that is going to work out quite 
explicitly, for example, if an analyst were to just say to an analysand, this is what's wrong with you, this can turn against the analyst in such a way that the analysand will turn away from that insight and project onwards to the analyst in such a way that they become now a source of anger, a source of um, focus or libidinal investment that deters away from engaging with what was explicitly just said. The analyst is in a sense a charlatan, they don't really say much, they, they are asking questions that further on this process of self-narration, to this point where in between torsions and tensions of the self-narrative, it speaks itself out. You don't need the analyst to say anything, it will eventually come by. The analyst is only directing or orchestrating in a very behind the scenes, mise en scene kind of sense in which this it will come into the fore of the scene. But it is not said by the analyst explicitly, it will be said by the analysand. So with this analytic situation, we're dealing with the question of how is it that the, in self-narration, the analysand is construing desire, especially in relationship to the analyst, who is kind of a charlatan and could be replaced by just about anyone. Evidently, Jordan Peterson did it, so why not someone else, right? Some other asshole. Uh, so when we're dealing with this kind of empty role of the big other, this kind of matrix of speech, the space for speaking, the space for meaning that we're engaging with, we're trying to make sense and we're trying to give meaning to how we desire, but we're only giving meaning to how we desire in relationship to someone else's desire. Uh, we're desiring in accordance to the desire of the other by asking a question that Lacan calls Chevois. What do you want from me? And this is how we come back to this question that in talking to the analysand as this other, this big other, we're not only finding desire, but we're making it too. Because by some form of fantasy about how is it that this person desire, we're also ourselves constructing our own desire. And we moved on from there to talking about how is it that this erotic transference, this relationship plays out, especially by talking a little bit about the case of Slavoj Žižek and how is it that he responds to this question, but in the terms of ideology as the similar side of the big other. In his respect, at least uh, from the excerpts of the 2005 documentary on Zizek, we can tell that Zizek is cautious about being the one that has the answers for the left. And that this dependence, this expectation placed upon him, it's only gonna be met by a form of disappoint disappointment. That we want something from him that he, in a sense, doesn't have. We want more than what he is in him in a sense and we are only going to come to terms with this by talking bullshit by finding different ways of talking around this experience and how so that our expectations or excesses to the other make themselves apparent in them that we see a stain of ourselves in Shishik when I'm expecting him to give me the solution to the left for example but in order to understand this a little bit more clearly we took on to this discussion about the registers of subjectivity, so the famous imaginary, symbolic, and real by a discussion of uh, the metaphoric subject of psychoanalysis, uh, which takes us back to this linguistic relationship, and also by a discussion of schema L, which was a major part of uh, Lacan's seminar of the Purloin letter. And from being able to discuss, uh, in generally, this formalization of these registers of subjectivity and how I said that they are interplaying with one another, we can we are able to give a case example like the one that Zizek gives us when he talks about woman as a symptom of man. Especially in the case of the current crisis of masculinity, we can understand this in the sense that with the rise of feminism and a lot of radical gender movements, the notion of woman has in a sense become, uh, like woman as a whole, la femme, has become not whole or apparently and more apparently not whole that it's not fully integrated in a way that we contain women so to speak and where we, when we're dealing with a question of male fantasy or how is it that one construes one both finds and makes desire by thinking about what the other wants i'm not only construing the other but i'm also construing myself 
And when this other, in the case of woman, starts to fade away or reach this point of vanishing, we are encountering ourselves also with a foundation of ourselves. We're starting to fail to recognize ourselves in a sense. Because when I'm understanding myself as myself, it's always in relationship to another at that point. So the crisis of masculinity obviously cannot come without this sort of circumstance. And this is not to say that uh, the, uh, the answer to the crisis of masculinity would be one such as uh, Jordan Peterson's in terms of doubling down on the question of meaning and patching this hall of inconsistency. Evidently that hasn't worked and it only further represses the problem of this inconsistency this failure of identity being identical with itself and meaning being eternally necessarily meaningful, these issues will deteriorate over time and folk like Peterson or more Jungian approaches to the question of psychoanalysis will not wholly patch the hole in meaning. There's gonna be some excess that they are not gonna be able to prepare us to confront and that's where the Lacanian alternative seems to have something more prepared in order to engage with the question. So we were able to talk about the registers of subjectivity, the structure of the subject, and the case example of woman as, as a symptom of man. And the last thing with that was pushing toward, towards some of the harder aspects of Lacan. His discussion, which is quite extensive, about the structure of the subject of psychoanalysis and his use of topology. We found that by looking at things like metaphor, the schema L, Lacan is looking to formalize something that he can describe in terms of more content, but he's able to distill it into a mathem, into some formalization of some form or another. And for Lacan, we'll see that this engagement with structure and topology moves from being strictly metaphorical the same way that we were starting to talk about analysis, talking about it from a distance, is uh, talking around it or in, in the more explicit sense of metaphor, that we are using wrong words to talk about something else, this metaphoric use of topology turns out to be itself the structure later on. For example, that by talking around psychoanalysis or talking around sexuality, we find ourselves having some form of access to it. And in this case, when we looked at various uh, uses of topology by Lacan to articulate this question of the psychoanalytic subject, we found that, especially with the question of the symptom, we reach a point of uh, non-intuition where we were only able to understand something about, say, a psychoanalytic uh, circumstance by re uh, reaching out to this use of topology that the metaphor actually came ac across an excess of itself in topology itself, so we learned something by um, not just using topology as a metaphor, but itself telling us something about the structure of the subject itself. So that's a general summary of what we were able to do so far. And Lacan and scholarship on Lacan is quite extensive, so this is at best some form of introduction to some of the general themes of, one, of what one will see in Lacan, and they will play out in various different senses. So at this point, I can start describing a little bit of how I started engaging with Lacan, because I heard, him, I heard about him in, uh, around the same time I was hearing about figures like Michel Foucault or Judith Butler, uh, Slavoj Žižek of course, but I, I mostly knew Žižek as a Marxist, which the more I got into Žižek, the less I, I saw some of the Marxist elements, which is kind of kind of funny. But the first time I got a book by Lacan was my coming across the complete text of Victory in English. I was in Calgary, Alberta, and I went to a bookstore that I like to frequent whenever I'm there, and I came across it. It was a thick, big collection of essays, which I wouldn't understand for the life of me. I had a similar experience when I tried to read Heidegger or when I tried to read Hegel. But of course, with uh, reading these people and playing around with language, eventually they come through. 
the same way that I came through to psychoanalysis by talking around it for a bit. My first experiences with psychoanalysis were very much concerned with mysticism. Because at the time, I was trying to conceive about this excess, but I could only conceive it as, as something theological. Uh, very much akin to something like Simone Weil's notion of God, as something that is an excess to the apprehension of, of what intelligence can account for, or reason can account for. So in this case, uh, we can talk meaning all we want, and reason can only talk meaning, but when it comes to talking about unre uh, the meaningless or the unreasonable or the radically contingent, then we're encountering that excess. The main difference to someone like Simone Weil is that Lacan's approach to the question doesn't return us back to God. Uh, it hovers around it. He doesn't concern necessarily himself with it, aside from what role something like God as a symbolic big other plays in terms of a relationship of how is it that one is subject, how is it that one goes through this seesaw of desire in that I am developing my own sense of identity in relationship to the other of God, but of course with different crises of faith that will come to be tested. So I'm actually looking at my copy of a Cree here and I remember, of course, being completely at a loss whenever, whenever I tried to do this. I tried reading the purloined letter and it went over my head, of course. I didn't know exactly what Lacan was trying to do and I didn't take Freud too seriously. So I was at a disadvantage of understanding Lacan when understanding Lacan ne almost necessitates a repetition of Freud. That's why he uses this phrase, re phrase return to Freud quite often. I mean, there's more, of course, to that phrase, but this repetition of Freud will highlight some aspects of the psychoanalysis that I didn't quite notice in Freud before, and when I went back to Freud, I was able to read a little bit more into him than I was giving him credit for at the time. So, I read the, I, I read the Perloin letter, and I didn't quite get it aside from the fact that there was a sort of motion that was going over the heads of the main characters of the, uh, of the story by Edgar Allan Poe that gave me at least that working intuition of what is it that is going over our heads in psychoanalysis. The same way that, for example, in poetry or in literature, there may be something that goes over our heads, and how is it that we are able to account for that thing that is going over our heads? I tried reading the mirror stage as, the formative, as, as formative of the, function, uh, the I function, and that one came through a little bit easier because I was already pretty familiar with questions of how is it that identity develops? I was familiar with some different forms of sociology and psychology where I was able to work on this intu intuition that is almost akin to object relationships in other forms of psychoanalysis. Of course, there are tensions between those schools, between Lacan and the object uh, relations folk. But it gave me something to work with to see how is it that in developing a sense of this other in the mirror, I'm also developing a sense of myself. So in the case of um, woman as a symptom of man, you could say that woman is in a sense a mirror of man. The notion that we have about woman tells us more about man, or at least insofar as we are concerned with a male fantasy, or ma um, masculine fantasy, more strictly speaking. I tried reading the function and field of speech and language in psychoanalysis and slowly I started getting a little bit more of the hang of this because I, I could see some cues that Lacan was taking from folk like Ferdinand de Saussure or Jacques Derrida. But the main thing that Lacan will differ from a lot of these figures, and I think particularly from someone like Derrida, um, though I think I can contest that in my own readings of Derrida, is uh, that the an, an analyst, as opposed to a, a deconstructivist theoretician, is always coming back to a position they're in. That the metaphoric God is telling you of a space, not just a displacement, but a space. And when someone like Derrida comes into the question of his own readings of psychoanalysis, he's a little bit more interested on the disseminations of these displacements. He's not looking into the metaphoric God uh, but rather focusing on metonymy. So by metonymy we're understanding this source of movements of displacements. Whereas metaphor before was a uh, site where the opening of meaning started by a form of condensation. Displacement will see things moving along 
And in Derrida, we see this plays out a lot in his notion of différence, in terms of a difference that, a difference that also defers the question. So that was my experience with the function and field of speech in, in and language in psychoanalysis. But I think the first time I started on understanding Lacan, and this is a topic that I didn't quite cover, but I think it's a very important one, especially for what Lacan has to teach us about psychoanalysis, is the text The Situation of Psychoanalysis and the Training of Psychoanalysts in 1956. And this is a very important text for Lacan in, uh, because it precludes some of the things that appear in his uh, seminar in uh, on the ethics of psychoanalysis, which starts by a, a discussion of excommunication. Lacan took on the question of training analysis very seriously, seriously enough that if we're looking at, at an institution like the International Psychoanalytic Institution, the IPA, when we're dealing with the question of almost a pyramid scheme, I won't say it in a sense that it's pretty, pretty playful, Lacan is trying to point out that when we are doing training analysis, do we ever overcome it the same way that we over uh, we may not fully overcome psychoanalysis? That as much as we're concerned with something something like uh, terminable analysis, how do we account for that interminable analysis, especially with the training of analysts? So Lacan takes insights of psychoanalysis, and to some extent he plays on how these insights are in effect in the institution of psychoanalysis itself. And this is very important because in many regards the training of analysis, a, 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 analysts is very much intertwined to lineages. For example, Zizek was uh, analyzed by Jacques L.A. Miller, who was in turn the uh, analysant and son-in-law of Jacques Lacan. And we see, in, in these various cases we're seeing different forms of lineages, for example all the different people that came from Freud and try to carry his lineage in different forms of way. In this sense, the whole notion of the Oedipal, Oedipal complex plays a sort of um, new meaning in the sense of how I said that we're dealing with this paternal function of this kind of origin, this kind of inheritance that we are passing along, and how I said that it's betrayed or played against or played out in some subversive sense over time. And of course, by the different divergent forms of psychoanalysis, there's plenty to be said about that, of course. So the situation of psychoanalysis and the training of psychoanalysts in 1956 is perhaps the first time I started understanding what Lacan was doing. And I think this is very important to Lacan and why I wanted to approach this introduction the way I did, by focusing on the clinical situation as a way to explore also whatever we can start calling maybe concepts of psychoanalysis or notions, working notions of the practice. That Lacan is not someone we can just understand in theory the way that a literary critic would take Lacan or a cultural studies person or women's studies person or uh, all these different points of view. Even the philosopher, I, I, I find that there's a disservice to the question of psychoanalysis when it's merely approached as a theory. The same way that I want to stress that there's an importance in reading Freud, especially if you're trying to understand Lacan, is in the same way that I think it's very important for us to engage with the question of the clinic to understand psychoanalysis, because it is not just theory, it's very intimately intertwined to its practice. In the case of Freud, we can consider how the case of Anna O oh and Joseph Brewer um, for those who don't know, uh, that was one of the first major patients that uh, were noted by Freud. And Anna O was someone who was considered to be a hysteric. Uh, and in his time, Freud was um, working with Joseph Brewer in terms of doing some research on the subject matter. Um, out of the whole relationship, they seem to be a, a sort of erotic transference that occurred between Brewer and Anna O that went awry with a bunch of stuff happening behind the scenes that seemed quite disturbing to Freud, enough that he took notice of the question of transference and started fleshing it out. How is it that these interpersonal relationships between a clinician and the patient are part of what an analyst or a psychologist has to account for? 
So, when we're looking at Freud's failures, I think those failures are very important to Freud. Um, perhaps I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself in calling uh, the case of Anna uh, oh, a failure, but ultimately it was disastrous for what that meant for that woman. That she was treated as another hysteric in such a way that she was just kind of dismissed. Someone who was just split up in what she wanted, that she, the, she almost just wanted to be loved, but the professional relationship couldn't quite return that. We see a lot of these different questions popping up in different forms of analysis. Lacan and Freud in their own practice were pretty cool people. Lacan is known for having five minute sessions, for example, or even having multiple analysants all at once coming to do their sessions. But when we contrast figures like this to someone like Donald Winnicott, Winnicott in comparison would work something that we can call the holding method. And by this, is a method of developing an environment that, almost in a metaphorical sense, holds on to the analysant, that it caresses them. So there's a, an example that I heard about Winnicott waiting outside his door for a, an analysant to come by, and the moment that they are just about to uh, open the door, Winnicott will open the door and be almost like this uh, grandfatherly figure, just ready to welcome you. And this is very important to psychoanalysis because we can start on understanding what it means to situate psychoanalysis. The very shape of the environment in which you are analyzing becomes very crucial to the practice. If we take a look at um, Lacan's seminar on the other side of psychoanalysis, that's a crucial question. He takes note of how many different places he's done his presentations at and how is it that by different audiences or by the different room he's in, the subject of psychoanalysis gets um, remorphed while still sustaining some of its properties and aspects, but point pointing them out in a different light. But this is something important to the very practices uh, of the clinic in the same way that the if we return to the image of the couch or the divan, in the case of Freud, he would stand behind the analysand so he, they wouldn't be facing him. So they wouldn't have someone to associate or invest emotionally towards while they're narrating. Quite the same way as someone like Winnicott who would meet the person head on. So it becomes this question of how is it that we are literally situating psychoanalysis and how that plays a role in the experience of the clinic as well as of the subject one is engaging on, that one is trying to pick out, in a sense. We can probably say a lot more about a Cree, and there are a lot of really interesting texts that I, I, I just want to mention in passing. For example, Lacan's presentation on the transference that tells us a little bit about his uh, style, in a sense. Um, I just kind of want to read, actually, the beginning of a Cree to point out something about it that it starts actually with a discussion about style and with an overture. So the first thing that Lacan invites us with into the text of Cree is a relationship between literature, literature or art and psychoanalysis by pointing, out this collection, uh, by pointing out this collection through an overture. So he starts by saying that, uh, in quotations, the style is the man. But we're also concerned with a style without a man. What is it, so, is, is it for example, the Lacanian style that overcame Lacan after time? Uh, it would be one important question of how is it that this, this style of Lacan has a major transferential effect in how is it that he was received by different forms of audiences or in different forms of lights. And Lacan is very much aware of how is it that his style ex escapes him to the point that even in the seminar on, on the other side of psychoanalysis, he talks about an occasion where he didn't quite catch himself responding quite rudely to a woman that was wondering about his seminar, uh, to the point that he actually apologized to her, to his general audience in the seminar, while hoping that if she was there, she would hear him out, but still putting that out there into the empty void of the big other that was his audience in a sense. The Freudian thing is pretty important especially because he elaborates on this question of the return to Freud, how is it that we are conceiving of the primal event of psychoanalysis? How is it that we even talk around psychoanalysis the way we have? 
And to return to the Freudian thing is returning to what is it that happens as the act of psychoanalysis. Um, so that's another point worth noting. Logical time and the assertion of anticipated certainty is going to be very important if we're trying to understand how is it that we understand things in an uh, après coup way, as in a sense that we are only understanding things by retrospection, which becomes very important about the for the function of self-narration in psychoanalysis. That very often times we are not quite fully at touch with why we do the things we do. So when we look when we look back at them, we try to give them some meaning. We're trying to give them some consistency. We're trying to make sense of our actions, give them meaning. And that's exactly why the what Lacan is trying to put attention for us is also where this retroaction is also coming into tensions with itself. And he provides us with a careful Re uh, reading and uh, presentation of how is it that this function of time in psychoanalysis, this form of retraction, is important to the practice. I think another point worth noting, and this comes alongside with uh, seminar three, in psychoanalysis we'll find that, uh, at least from its inception, it was mostly focused on the question of, of repression and neuroticism. That's almost like the key fears that we think about psychoanalysis, because that's, in a sense, where it started, by looking at neurotics and how is it that they're engaging with repressive practices. But, of course, that's not the end of psychoanalysis. We mentioned before how is it that the form of perversion operates through a disavowal, and we talked at length about psychosis, and that's something that is very important to Lacan and his engagements. A text that is very important to look at, especially if we're looking at this question of lineages, would be the text on my antecedents. And in this respect, Lacan tells us about where he started focusing questions like psychosis, but also the notion of the automaton, which plays a major role in uh, Lacan's conception of the subject. This text uh, turns us towards Gatien de Clerambault, and how is it that uh, Lacan refers to him basically his only master in psychiatry? But also Lacan, in a sense, returns to Freud in, in the sense of lineage by pointing out how uh, Claire Rambol took from Repellin. And then he takes us to Freud. So it's pretty important if we're trying to look at where Lacan is coming from and also how he plays out in, into his clinical practices, as well as his interest on questions like psychosis, at uh, this point in which the unconscious is there but it's not functioning there's a disconnection from the symbolic which we've been able to count structurally before in the last session on topology so at this point we have mostly talked about ecri which is a collection of papers which are titled as writings but we may know that most of the things that Lacan did were presentations so when we're looking at Lacan oftentimes we're gonna be turning towards the seminars and these seminars were edited by Jacqueline Miller and presented to us often through many translators, as Jane Gallup has mentioned in her, her text on reading Lacan. So when we're looking at the seminars, we're going to be looking at a grand variety of work that Lacan has available for us. And the main thing that I want to no uh, note is that if you're looking at the seminars by yourself, I would highly recommend starting with the first few seminars. They will be a little bit slower, but Lacan is operating in a way that he's not being as stylistic and playful as the later ones. It's more likely that something will go over your head in the later texts, and it's a challenge because he plays a lot on the limits of knowledge. He plays a lot on the limits of language of expression, uh, this thing that we've been circling around oftentimes. But I, I would recommend certainly the first three seminars are very interesting on, on how Lacan looks at the question of technique in Freud, but also the development of the ego. And how is it that Lacan, one of the major criticisms that Lacan is looking to set out, is as opposed to, to an ego psychology that only looks to optimize the ego without putting it at tensions with itself. In the case of someone like Jordan Peterson as a form of uh, self-help book almost turns out to be a figure who is just looking to patch the ego, to get this person to self-optimize, become an individual. But for Lacan, the question of engaging with the ego is just more than that. It doesn't stop at giving it consistency as um, making it an individual, 
but also look at the excesses of that individuality, at the excesses of how society conceives itself as an ego image of itself. So Lacan's first two seminars will be concerned with technique and the function of the ego, uh, taking it away from an ego psychology that looks to appropriate work, uh, Freud's uh, work towards use and optimization of psychological subjects. The psycho, uh, formal psychosis, the seminar in psychosis, which is the third seminar, will deal with subjects that are not quite fitting that method of uh, ego psychology. This is a text that I will refrain uh, from, uh, from saying much because I haven't quite read it in detail as much as I would like to, but it's one of those texts that is apparent, very apparent that it is important to Lacan, especially since this question of psychosis plays a major role on, all the way onto his later work. So for those who are uh, looking to take Lacan seriously, I would recommend taking this text that I didn't quite take seriously myself at the time. We can do a little bit of a leap later on into other texts, and we can be looking at the ethics of psychoanalysis, which I have right here, and I'm kind of going to look through a little bit. The eth Try to remember which one I read first. I think it was the four fundamental concepts of psychoanalysis, which I also have at, at hand. Yes, the f um, the four fundamental concepts of psychoanalysis might be my recommendation of somewhere to go after those first seminars, or even if you feel more confident, maybe skipping those first seminars. The four fundamental concepts of psychoanalysis, Lacan will do a pretty thorough exploration of this question that we brought up earlier about excommunication. Uh, so Lacan did a very heavy uh, look at how I said that the learnings of psychoanalysis in some way play out in the psychoanalytic institution itself. And that amounted to Lacan being expelled, excommunicated from the IPA. And it had a major effect on how I said that Lacan was considered to be a legitimate psychoanalyst amongst his peers. I think this is a very important text to understand where Lacan stands in relationship to what he's teaching us. Um, but it's also pretty interesting for learning some of the m aspects that we have gone over and how I said that they play out in a, a variety of different subjects like optics. Lacan uh, focuses a lot on how I said that things are visualized, and how I said that desire plays into the role of vision, how I said that it plays into aesthetics, how I said that it plays into the very practice of analysis. So we'll see Lacan focusing on the unconscious and repetition, uh, we'll see Lacan focusing on the question of the gaze and the object petia, so this little object of desire that is almost like an excess symptom of myself and it's kind of playing more of a role of, of a stain on myself on what I'm trying to desire. And then he'll focus also on the question of transference and drive. And from the question of the drives, Lacan will come back to the field of the other and to the question of transference. And how I said that the subject in fantasy and transversing fantasy will have different forms of ways in which it'll come out of the session, for example. How I said that we'll engage with forms of alienation or separation from what is alienating it. Uh, the Ethics of Psychoanalysis is a little bit of a more thorough text. The beginning of it will be talking about the thing, which means that we're going to be talking around the thing, thing we talk around, but also the question of ethics in psychoanalysis becomes very important because we are also considering how is it that we desire, and how is it that we desire uh, what we will. Um, the best way I can put this is that if, we, if there's anything we'd learn from the philosopher Immanuel Kant, is the categorical imperative, but the formulation I'll give to the uh, categorical imperative is just the general notion of duty as you must, just the form that you must. The question is not quite clear of what you must do, and that's where the question of desire in psychoanalysis starts entangling with the question of ethics. When we are looking at a superego or trying to desire in accordance to an uh, other who is supposed to know better than me, I'm also engaging with uh, moral injunctions uh, to injunctions that are saying you must enjoy this way or you must. So Lacan in this question will be looking at how that plays out. How I said that this question of injunctions will play out in different forms of way and articulate it in, in terms of both the analytic practice but in elements of philosophy as well as literature. 
in this case we we can see a very interesting reading of the play Antigone that it's almost at odds with something like well not at odds but it's playing alongside like something like Hegel's reading of Antigone in the phenomenology of spirit so Antigone being uh, the story uh, this Greek tragedy about a woman named Antigone whose uh, family has essentially been uh, looked down upon uh, or frowned upon by the state and her brother dies but he's not given a ritual because of his uh, because of this relationship her family holds to the state so it becomes this question of what is the right thing for Antigone to do something that works upon the social injunctions that are already given by a symbolic other that's supposed to know the state Creon who is the head of the state or this excess uh, to the injunction in that she's almost abiding by a law of the underworld, a law of the undercommons that is reframing the very notion of the moral itself at the same time. These are not necessarily the best readings, of course, but it's something to work with. Um, I mentioned the other side of psychoanalysis, uh, and I don't think I have much else to say about it other than Lacan starts developing the notion of his four discourses a little bit more so. Um, he uh, uh, to my understanding has developed them in some of the earlier seminars but here's where he's trying trying to play them out in a sense that it pertains to the very thing he's doing in presenting to people and with that I, I with that I want to turn to my two favorite texts by Lacan um, would be uh, seminar 20 which is titled Encore or also on feminine sexuality the limits of love and knowledge and I think this is exactly the aspect that ego psychologists wouldn't be able to think about without something like Lacan um, these are texts this text is particularly difficult and it goes alongside with uh, another text that was uh, released separately called uh, Le Tout Dit. Um so the best translation I can give it at, at the top of my head would be the kind of like boss headed or the, uh, by boss headed I mean someone who is fuzzy headed in terms of their mental clarity in in this text Lacan is challenging a lot of the foundations in things like philosophy but also the practice of psychoanalysis especially by looking at these excesses that uh, we are trying to constantly reduce into a condensation into metaphoric meaning and this question of the feminine becomes more apparent in insofar as it pertains to the other side of metaphor not the side of what it, it, it can it can be talked about as meaningful but that that hovers outside meaning that access to meaning aside from that i think the last text by lacan himself i want to mention is a small collection of presentations that lacan gave in uh, the late 60s if i remember well called uh, my teaching it is published by verso books and it's a, a few kind of odd presentations that Lacan gives to various different people and when I read them I found it to be just playful enough that it might be worth sitting down for a fun read. It is th These texts are probably some of my favorites of Lacan uh, particularly because they're pretty different from one another. Um, lit liturgy and uh, feminine sexuality in that they are very complex and will demand you to play close attention to what Lacan is in a sense talking around and not able to actually talk about explicitly and how is it that he can only approximate this by mathematical formulations in Lacanian algebra uh, whereas the presentations of my teaching are a little bit more f f uh, playful you're not uh, you're not straining yourself as much in trying to pursue this access to thought um, but these, pres uh, these presentations are a little bit more didactic in terms of what Lacan means for the practice in terms of how uh, psychiatrists are engaging with it or how is it that people interested in law are engaging with it, how is it that we understand things like society. I think one of my favorite uh, present uh, things that Lacan said was a little discussion about Aldous Huxley and how is it that uh, both of them consigned in this idea that in order for any great civilization to happen they need a sewage system, so somewhere where they're putting the shit away. And I kind of mentioned this in that for Lacan it's very crucial that this excess, this uh, disposed of waste, is crucial to what uh, psychoanalysis is trying to understand as true, as sexuality or this act of analysis as something excessive to uh, a very coherent or consistent form of knowing. That what psychoanalysis is invited us to consider by the excessive 
this exceeding excess is the indeterminate, the indifferent, the um, what is, is, star is starting to play out besides all differences. With that, um, I want to mention a few other texts that are not necessarily by Lacan, but I found very interesting. Uh, in the case of um, Shoshana Feldman has a book called Jack Lacan and the uh, uh, Adventures of Insight, if I remember well, at the top of my head. But it's coming from someone in the American context who is one of the first people to very inquisitively go into reading Lacan. And much like another commentator called Jane Gallup, both of them came across various issues of how people consider Lacan to be legitimate at all and uh, whether they were constantly challenged of whether they actually understood Lacan. Um, in the case of Jane Gallup, she kind of, in her book, Reading Lacan, she plays on the fact that she won't understand Lacan, that there's an excess to not understanding Lacan as a way of finding her, her way in. And in the case of Shoshana Feldman, she provides a lot of different aspects from literature and French studies as a way of understanding what is it that Lacan is trying to do. For example, if we're reading uh, the question of the Oedipus complex after Freud and through the lens of Lacan, what can we say not about uh, the play Oedipus Rex, but Oedipus at Colonus that is technically happening later? What happens after Freud? What do we learn about psychoanalysis in this repetition of Freud? The next thing I would recommend would be actually reading Freud. Um, understanding Lacan you, you can try to play by ear, but I don't think you'll get as much from Lacan if you don't read Freud or don't engage with Freud. And it'll be very important in a lot of different ways. Um, some of the texts that I personally like going back to uh, back to by Freud are texts like um, Morning and Melancholia, or some of the metapsychological papers, like him dealing with the notion of the ego and the id, or dealing with the question of group psychology. Um, and... Also interested on some of uh, Freud's lectures, like the introductory lectures on psychoanalysis or the new introductory lectures on psychoanalysis. I particularly find the latter, uh, latter ones interesting because this is a point where Freud has developed mouth cancer. He can't really present orally, so he still writes lectures under the supposition that he's going to be speaking them, but he's not. So there's an interesting sort of performativity that is worth reading into um, because it tells you a little bit of how important this practice of speaking is to psychoanalysis and how important it was for Freud to engage in that practice. So much so that his writing was like his speaking. Alongside with the metapsychological texts, the lectures, one will say you will probably have to read the, the interpretation of dreams um, it's a pretty interesting text. I personally don't have much to say about it, um, but it is an important text to read. Um, I personally find that some aspects of it I've been able to draw from uh, some of his wor work on aesthetics. So writings about the uncanny or writings about how I said that condensation and displacement work in the work of art. Um, I find that teach me, taught me enough about that, but if I were to recommend something, that it's not quite um, an in the interpretation of dreams, it would be the psych psychopathology of everyday life. I think it's Freud's book for the masses in that it's starting with discussions like jokes or things that are readily available for people. Um, if you're looking for uh, some uh, background work on Freud, Jonathan Lear's book on Freud can be quite uh, interesting because he touches Freud from not only his own text, but also from the different sorts of disciplines that uh, came from Freud. So, for example, um, Lear will mostly focus on Freud, but in occasions he'll bring up how said that uh, object relationists like Winnicott or Melanie Klein have their different takes on Freud, or how said that uh, Lacan, uh, La the Lacanian practice takes a lot from some of the excesses of this question of transference that is very crucial to the Freudian event. The, it's, uh, for particularly Lacan, the Slovenian school of, of philosophy and psychoanalysis is very interesting. Uh, the most notable oftentimes is Slavoj Žižek, which we talked about plenty. And if I were to suggest some texts by him, it would be the sublime object of ideology, which 
he has quarrels with because he used to believe in democracy and he doesn't quite the same anymore. Um, but it's a very important text for seeing intersections between uh, Lacanian psychoanalysis, uh, Marx's notions of, notion of the commodity as the symptom of capitalism, and also Hegelian readings of uh, this general question, or even Lacanian readings of Hegel. But aside those texts, I would also recommend Less Than Nothing, which is a little bit of a heavier text, uh, but it's engaging with some of the more contemporary questions that Zizek is interested on, and which also pushed Lacan alongside uh, to engage with questions like the current speculative realist mo movement or different questions in, in cogniz uh, cognitivism, whether psychoanalysis is irrelevant, as well as looking at the excesses and limits of the Hegelian dialectic. Of course, that's for people that are more interested in philosophy. One other person that I want to mention of the Slovenian school, however, would be Alenka Zupanjic. Alenka, Alenka Zupanjic uh, has a text that I would recommend called Why Psychoanalysis? And in it, she's quite clearly being able to look at uh, why psychoanalysis is still relevant but also pick apart what is it that made the Freudian event meaningful and important to the development of the practice, as well as what is it that happened with Lacan. What was the slight difference in the questions they, they were asking that Lacan might have flipped also the, the whole practice of psychoanalysis upside down to some extent. Shupanshik elaborates on this question that I kind of mentioned, briefly speaking, in the Ethics of Psychoanalysis, about how is it that in, uh, moral injunctions, like in the Kantian categorical imperative, play out in the context of psychoanalysis. And if you are looking for a more dedicated treatment than what I offered here, which was not much, Alenka Zupanchik has a book called The Ethics of the Real, which is about Lacan and Kant, which is also taking on from Lacan's reading of Kant and Sade de Mark. If you are interested in Lacan from a philosophical standpoint, as strictly as a philosopher, it might be worth looking at how folk like Hélène Badieu take on the question of Lacan. One text that I would recommend uh, by, uh, by Lacan with someone else called Barbara Casson would be There's No Such Thing as a Sexual Relationship. And it's two lessons on Lacan, one from the more deconstructionist point of view that Barbara Kassan ex ex uh, expands on, and Hélène Badiou from the more formalized point of view. Badiou being a um, trained mathematician turned philosopher is, is very dedicated to the use of a uh, set theory, his major text being an event as well as the logical worlds, the sequel to it, but generally his work mathematics plays a major role, and Badiou is very much interested on this use of mathematics in Lacan, because if we are talking all differences aside, Lacan was only able to pick apart the truth of psychoanalysis by uh, uh, distilling the formalization out of it. The same way that we were able to talk about different forms of topology, see how the subject of psychoanalysis retains certain properties or what gets changed out of it with different alterations to its form. Lacan, uh, from Lacan, we move on to Badiou, who's taking this question of Lacan's use of mathematics seriously, but in a sense that he sees that Lacan did something with it. In tandem to these two fellows, uh, Badiou and Lacan, we may also introduce uh, Quentin Meillassou, whose text after Finitude is trying to do away with a lot of the uh, a lot of the practices of philosophy that have put it at a, at a certain deadlock in critical traditions after a uh, human Kant. Um, this question of mathematization and formalization is pretty crucial to Quentin Meillassou, but read Meillassou if you're interested as, uh, with, the, uh, with this importance of the use of mathematics in Lacan, uh, what value was able to take out of it, and the extent in which Meillassou's critique expands to a lot of contemporary philosophy that came after um, David Hume and Immanuel Kant. There are other figures in post-Lacanian psychoanalysis that are worth noting. Some of these I, I 
feel like I not necessarily quite I, I won't be quite objective to talk about it because these are the people that I kind of followed through in order in order to do some of my own work. Um, I would mention Luce Rigare, who much like Lacan, who got excommunicated from the uh, IPA, uh, Luce Rigare got ex expelled from uh, Lacan's Frodion's Ecole. Uh, so I think that's an interesting figure to look at. Uh, because I am personally of the thought that to actually be an analyst, your graduation is really just being excommunicated. To get kicked out is is, is it. It's a ceremony. It's a ritual. Um, that's coming from a feminist point of view. And she does some interesting work, particularly in this uh, speculum of the other, uh, where she tries to reinterpret the history of philosophy under the lens of psychoanalysis and this question of desire to put attention to some of the philosophical figures in, in this canon. So, uh, Luce Rigere, uh, is, uh, Lucy Rigere is someone who is looking at uh, the philosophical tradition from a psychoanalytic standpoint. If we turn towards uh, Julia Kristeva, I would recommend some texts like Black Sun or The Powers of Horror, but my personal and a personally important one would be Strangers to Ourselves. Um, in the case of Julia Kristeva, we're also looking at another form of uh, feminist approach or one that is influenced by those sensitivities into dealing with uh, a lot of the questions that uh, Lacan may do away with quite coldly. Um, for example, one of the key questions to uh, Kristeva would be this question on, of the object. At this point in which one is not quite an object nor a subject, so one is caught in this almost unborn state. And how is it that this plays out into a lot of different relationships? For example, in the deployment of, um, of political horrors, where one is um, basically disenfranchised into the object position, or in the case of... Um, immigration or being l'étranger, the stranger, the outsider, the foreigner, that plays a major role in Strangers to Ourselves. Black Sun is interesting to read in tandem to Freud's discussions in, uh, in Morning and Melancholia, uh, because Black Sun is very, a text dedicated to the question of depression. It, it is quite a beautiful text, and I, I would recommend it solely in that aspect, but there's also a lot to learn from it in terms of psychoanalytic practice. I think at this point, I would just kind of keep on rambling about different fears that I found important in psychoanalysis. Um, and I think at this point, just giving a sense of so, some of the figures that particularly stand out to me, which I, I think the same way that an analysand gives a little bit too much away when they speak out, Probably throughout this whole discussion of Lacan, I've been giving out some of the things that have influenced my own readings of Lacan. So, if you have any questions or comments, I'm, I'm really curious to see what people thought out of this. At this point, um, I'm trying to consider what I'm going to do next after this little series on Lacan. Uh, so if you have any suggestions or recommendations, uh, make them known. Uh, just to kind of put it out there, um, just so people know a little bit of what I studied, I came from being one of those people that was super into existentialism because that's like the cool shit for the cool kids. And so if you're interested in something of the sort, I can easily do a, a few presentations on figures like Jean Paul Sartre or Simone de Beauvoir. I'm very interested on some of the figures like uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, but also uh, Franz Fanon. And there's going to be a lot of different figures on that form of existential phenomenology trend that come in a variety of different sense. Um, I have just gone, gotten through the phenomenology of spirit by Hegel a few times, so it's a text that I find very interesting and I wouldn't mind coming back to to teach a little bit about it or some of the things that stuck out to me from it. Uh, figures like Foucault, I had a little Foucault phase when everything was discourse. Um, and also this way of make, uh, having an ethics of making a self in self-mastery, I, I could do a little bit of Foucault. So the things are quite open. I've been kind of playing with the idea of doing uh, a couple of videos on either Slavoj Žižek or Jack Derrida. Um, so it, it kind of depends on what people seem to be more interested on out of these things, but I'm also gonna 
try to do a few things of my own particular interest and try to share with folks. So with that, I'm concluding this introductory series in Lacan, and anything that comes after is probably going to be a more in-depth exploration of uh, doing Lacanian readings or certain things, or even furthering on some of the more complex aspects of uh, Lacanian psychoanalysis. So it's been interesting. I, I haven't done uh, this sort of podcast, videocast sort of ex thing before, and it's interesting that I chose psychoanalysis, particularly uh, Lacanian psychoanalysis, as the first thing to do so, because I'm literally talking to a mic that is not a person. And uh, in some sense, that's really funny in terms of what I'm doing and what I'm trying to explain. So hopefully you enjoyed me trying to construe my own desire surrounding psychoanalysis. Hopefully you learned a little bit about yours. <laughs>